BraveWords.com brings you the metal news each and every day. And this week on Dropping the Needle, we bring you Metal Tim Henderson, owner of BraveWords.com. Dropping the Needle. You're listening to Dropping the Needle, the podcast where all music from all genres is discussed. New releases, classic albums, rediscovered music, signed and unsigned. No ass kissing. Just two guys talking about music. Here are your hosts, Michael Brandvold from Michael Brandvold Marketing and Mitch LaFon. Everybody, welcome to another episode of Dropping the Needle, the talk show that's been described as if Beavis and Butthead ever had their own show, this would be it. <laughs> I'm Beavis, that other guy's no. Butthead. No. <laughs> I'm... I'm Michael Brandvold, one of your co-hosts from michaelbrandvold.com, and as always, I'm joined by that, and, and Tim, you will love this, it's in his contract, the, world, the, the world-renowned, the world illustrious rock journalist, That's right. Mitch LaFon. Hey, you <laughs> finally got it right. Woo. Hold on, hold Woo-hoo. on, hold on. I'll, I guess that I'll... lawyer's letter helps. There you go. <laughs> As we move there, into comedy. There we go. Uh, nice. Mitch, who, yeah. who, is, uh, who is joining us in this virtual world today? Well, you know, we, we've got uh, somebody who started off in a record store, and he put out this little thing called Meat Magazine, which I think was photocopy stapled together, pretty much, right? And then he moved on to Brave Words and Bloody Knuckles Magazine, and of course, as magazine readership became uh, more tenuous, he moved into the online world with BraveWords.com, which, you know, to this day is probably still my favorite source of metal news because it covers all genres and it covers it in depth and it covers it quickly, which is important in an online world. You can't be doing stuff a week later. And it covers it, quite honestly, without all yeah. the haters that destroy every post on other websites. Right, because they've chosen to not put the fan response form thingy right after every post, and that keeps it clean. You, you want to read about your favorite band, Kiss, Sabbath, whatever, you get to do it without that Okay, so tell us his name. <laughs> um, hold on. No, uh, Metal Tim Henderson, founder, CEO, and the brains behind the whole thing. Kit and Caboodle of BraveWords.com. Welcome, G'day. Tim. Welcome. Do you, do, you want, you. do you want us to call you Metal or Tim? You know what? <laughs> it's Metal. Whatever you choose. MT, just, Tim is fine. Tim is fine. So here, here, yeah. here's, here's a funny little fact. So when I joined AOL, if anybody remembers AOL from eons ago, and mm-hmm. I had to pick a username, I picked Metal Mike. Right, I remember that. I was Metal Mike for the longest time on AOL. And everybody was calling me, all my friends would call me Metal. Hey, Metal, how you doing? I'm getting the same thing, but there are so many Metal Mikes out there these days, it's crazy. Yeah, and there are Mike Metals, and there's just too many. Yeah, I, when, when I finally said I was done with AOL, I'd never use it anymore. I'm like, all right, I'm just going to let that go. But I'm sure somebody will love to grab that username. It was probably 1985 I started using Metal Tim, calling into radio stations in southern Ontario requesting things that would never get played. <laughs> I, yeah. rem- I remember Meat Magazine. I probably have an issue or two buried in a storage box somewhere. Because when I worked with, uh, I worked at an indie record label out of Chicago <laughs> called Red Light Records and Grindcore International. Wow. Uh, and uh, then I also worked with some indie bands. There was a band called Defcon out of Chicago. And I'm th- pretty sure I remember sending in demo tapes with press kits to Meet Magazine. Well, originally it meant metal events around Toronto, but it certainly was a nationwide magazine. And I did my internship there for a number of years, actually. So that's definitely where my roots, and I need to kind of um, thank the people behind, um, the, the, the brains behind Meat Magazine to where I've gotten to right now, because that, um, they, they taught me a lot about magazines. And then we kicked the hell out of them. <laughs> <laughs> don't, take yeah. it, don't take it personally. It's just business. Well, no, it really it's, is. It's, it's, well, they actually went. To, they actually turned into a country magazine, and I'm trying to remember the name off the top of my head. Um, so really, they were they they had but long gone by the time Brave Words had started its little fanzine dumb in March 1994. 
Wow. Yeah. So, so, so let's go, go ahead, Mike. No, I was going to say, go ahead, Mitch. I was going to ask, you know, let's, let's talk <clears throat> a little history here. Yeah. That's the beginnings right there. March 1994, 200 copies. I still remember taking it to this little print shop and um, I didn't want any ads. I didn't want any photos. Get into that later because I was. I just wanted. It was really just for fans, and I thought photos were just would just get in the way of the words because we all just wanted to read the updates on our on our band. So yeah, two hundred copies only sold at HMV three 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 on Young Street in Toronto. And um, right now, I think I have in my possession two or three. So they're wow. worth something on eBay. Do you do you know anybody? Have you encountered anybody who has an original copy? Oh yeah, yeah. No, I the odd time for sure. Absolutely. It took a couple of weeks to sell those two hundred, and then, then it started to rise after that, and so did okay. the ad revenue a little bit. So to pay for it, but I read the print bill was like one hundred and eighty dollars or something crazy. So it was it was oh, cool. The day it was it was expensive. So Tim, tell us how did you get it into the store? I mean, I know you're an employee at HMV, but were they not reticent to have just? You know, some guy bring in magazines. You know, it wasn't a universal product. It wasn't a uh, record company product. I got to imagine that HMV was not profiting a lot off of selling your zine. Well, it actually fell under the indie section. So they were making, I guess, their 25%, which they did with all indie product at the time. Um, but I, like, I'd been a buyer there for a while. Um, I started pretty much when the store began. Like I would, It was about a month into um, when 333 launched. And keep in mind, like Young Street, it was record row at the time with, with Sam's and Cheapies. There, there, was a, there was a lot of action down there. Now it's, it's a little bit dismal. But... Um, yeah, no, I had a great rapport with management. I was a buyer. I um, I brought this thing in. It complemented everything in the metal section. It totally made sense. Though the, how fast it sold is just a testament of, of um, I guess, the quality and, and the passion that was in the thing. And um, yeah, and, and that's where it all launched, March nineteen ninety four. No, so, back, back ninety nine. Sorry, that was somewhat pre internet. So where was the information that you were printing coming from? That's a good question. As I um, kind of rewind back, um, it had to be from other magazines. Uh, we were still doing a ton of interviews. I had pretty much just left Meat, so I had okay. all these industry contacts um, um, with with labels and whatnot. So there was enough content out there to actually build a magazine. I'm trying to remember how many pages it was was it eighteen or something. Um, but no, it was there, there was enough out there. There was there was enough to kind of scrape up and and throw into um, and, and create a magazine for sure. And then my last question before I turn over, Mike, just what qualified you to write a magazine? Were you, did you, were you a journalist? Were you just a really devoted fan? Is that it? I was definitely a devoted fan. Okay. My roots go a little bit before that because when I was at McMaster, which is in Hamilton, which is just a little bit west of Toronto. The university. That. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So I um, graduated from that, but I did college radio, and that's where actually I met um, the guy from Meat Magazine, Drew Masters, when I started to write for him. And after the falling out that we had, I just had all this content, all these contacts. I'm like, what do I do? I, I want to do this. My passion is heavy metal. Um, I ended up working, as I say, at, at the record store. So I met up with Martin Popoff and, um, and, we, and we launched it. Okay. So, so at what point did you look at your little fanzine and all of a sudden go, Wow, this is no longer a little fanzine that's just for the Toronto area. Uh, you know what? I, 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 another valid question. Um, we just had the fire. We just had the fire to keep this thing going. We were we were bringing in this like all the compete all the competing magazines from around the world, whether it been Kerrang or uh, Metal, Metal Hammer, Hammer. Or, or or whatever back then. Keep in mind it was ninety four, right? I don't even think Terrorizer was around back then. Um, no, but we just I guess we just had the fire and a vision to create a, a magazine. It's but was it your lost. selling out every week? Then that people said you got to take it to the next level because I mean if they're just sitting there gathering dust. No, it, the, the first one, as I said, it took a couple of weeks, and then two months later, the next one, we, we started gathering advertising. We started actually bundling, whether it be stickers or, or cassettes at the time. The Knuckle Tracks um, debuted. Concept. In, right. in, yeah, that, that debuted in issue number 26. But uh, w within the first 10 issues, I had meetings with, um, with, with the Ontario um, 
um, store managers. Keep in mind, HMV at its peak was what, like over a hundred stores. So just right. to get into Southern Ontario or, or at least Ontario and Quebec, like that was like a good 20, 30 stores. When I was, I was used to one store. So when, when I had orders from 20 plus stores, it was like, wow, I get to print yeah, maybe close to a thousand magazines now. So it was, it was really that kind of a fire that, oh my God, people are getting, are, are catching on to this. I had free distribution. I can say that out loud right now. So I was just able to put it in boxes and they would just take it to the store level and it, it's, it just kind of caught on fire like that. Do you remember the day or the moment where you said, you know what, this is no longer sort of a side hobby passion. It, it today is becoming a real job and this is a real magazine and this is what I'm going to be doing for a living. You know what? I juggled um, being a buyer at literally, we, we were doing close to a million dollars gross in heavy metal sales. That's no word of a lie. I've got, I've got the paperwork to prove it. So we were rocking what well, probably, probably the biggest heavy metal section in North America. Um, I didn't want to let that go. It was pretty easy for me to balance and, and juggle the time to create the magazine, obviously with a team um, of writers and, and Martin and, and, and editors and stuff. But um, I can't actually remember the exact time. Well, when I quit HMV, it was it's got to be at least ten years ago. So there there definitely came a time, but there was there was other things, um, other jobs that the radio jobs that kind of took my time as well. So I've just I'm just a multitasker. But yeah, it went for a long time, um, being a buyer at the superstore and running this magazine. It be, it became literally it, it's it doubled and tripled the sales of every magazine. Rolling Stone and Spin, for example, were the two top magazines at the time, and we doubled those sales. Like that's in how many, in, in, in that one store, in that okay. one store. So I was bringing in like four or 500 copies of Brave Words, and they would fly. It was pretty crazy. So how, how, how did you slowly go from um, Toronto to all of Ontario to all of a sudden, wow, North America, Europe, you know, all of a sudden, People are calling me saying, we want to sell your magazine in New York City, in Los Angeles, in London, I'm assuming. Yeah. You know, what was I that saw like? It. What was that I like? I saw it at the Tower Records in Sunset. So, yeah, I saw it around the world. No, we, after like the HMV thing... Um, it was a lot of a lot of one offs, a lot of indies. We had maybe at its peak, like pushing like a hundred separate stores that we would we would service, and then it just got to, it got got way too much to handle. So we had to bring in like a third party to actually distribute this thing through the proper magazine chains to get it into airports, to get it into Seven Elevens, you name it. Um, that then like then the then the actual print run like quadrupled. And that's when you become like a, a really big beast. And I remember the, the guy that was, was, was handling our magazine. If you have a successful magazine, then you have a license to print money. But this is, that's a mean world. You know what I mean? It's, it's re returns you would get like the top of a magazine back. You know what I mean? Everything would go in the garbage. It would, it, you'd be lucky if you sold like 30% of your run. So it was, it was a numbers game. It was really challenging. It was, it was like a, a college course right there. Um, and then when we expanded into the world and got into a number of different countries, it was just the lag time to get, you know what I mean? It was, we would have, it would take like three, four months to get an issue into Italy or something like that. And then the sales would just be this roller coaster. So it was, I'm just happy I break words got, got calm right now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I can imagine. No, Seriously. No, if, you, no. if, you, if you, if you walked in my footsteps and you'd ask any publisher, and because people are always asking, oh, what, what's the, I've got subscribers, people asking to subscribe to the magazine all the time. It's like, no, if you could look into my eyes, I've been there, done that. Not that it was hell. It was, it was a, a great experience, but it's, it's, it's like night and day compared to right now. Yeah, I mean, my, I, I, I remember when I started Kiss Otaku, the, the, my first Kiss the website. website, it actually started as an attempt to do a Kiss fanzine. I sort of felt like, listen, I, I'm working in an advertising department of a company. I've got access to some nice high-end printers and computer equipment and desktop publishing software. I'm like, I could probably lay out a very cool little Kiss fanzine here and put what I want out there. And then as I laid it out, it dawned on me. I'm like, crap, printing and distribution. Yeah. I don't want to spend any money to do that shit. I don't because that will kill me. So I immediately was like, "All right, how can I do a digital magazine?" 
And this is when PDF was first coming around. So I'm like, what if I make a PDF magazine? I print the magazine to a PDF digital file and let people download this digital file. Well, that didn't quite work as nice as I want because the formatting sucked. And it, you know, we're talking 95, 96. It's nothing like what you can do now. Nothing. It was very rudimentary. It was even earlier than that, wasn't it? No, I mean, no, the Kiss I, Union I, tour was 96. I, Otaku must have been 94, no, 93. No, I, I, I launched it in May of 95. Okay. I was probably playing around with this whole concept 94 into 95. Okay. But then, then it just hit me. It's like, wow, there's this thing called HTML that's coming around. And you can build these little websites. And I saw that website <laughs> as, well, that could just be my magazine. Yeah. And I update yeah. that, and I let people come to me. And I exactly. don't have to distribute anything. And there's no cost to me. And it's like that literally <clears throat> was, was my light bulb moment of going, wow, I can do everything I wanted to do and have no cost to produce it. And people come to me to get it. Yeah, and, but it's, and, it's 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 sorry, sorry. No, no, no. I was just gonna say that that was that revolutionary moment of going from print to online that just made sense. Now, before Tim got to online, though, he did print and online together, where the online was more of a added value and not necessarily a different beast. So, when you were looking at the magazine and at the at the website, at some point, did you say? These numbers don't make sense. Uh, I need to update this site with fresh news. But if I take away all the fresh news, then I got no content for the magazine. So when did you say, I can't have both? It doesn't make sense. Well, the magazine started to fund the website because the website oh. launched around 2000. And then it came to a point where the website, website was really helping the magazine. And that's when, in 2008, we said, this, this is it. we got to pull the plug on this thing. I can't afford There's no advertising for magazines. Right. Um, yeah, but it's, it came to a point. It was, wasn't, just, wasn't just money, but it was time. I was laying out the news in the magazine. I've always been the news guy, even with, with, when Brave Words was, was at its peak. And I'd be seeing this magazine on, on the shelf at HMV or looking at the distribution when I know it would land in, in Austin, Texas. And I'm like, this news has just changed in the last hour. But what is going into someone's hands in, in, in Florida? It's, this is like two months old. Like, this is this got to be a dated concept, right? Mm -hmm. So it's you not know I mean it just dawned on me that um, and, well the numbers really shone at the time. But keep in mind we were a Canadian magazine. Right. So you tell that to Decibel and Revolver these days. They're US based, they're doing a great job, they're still flourishing. Um, but at the time being a Canadian magazine, I think that had that was one of the nails in the coffin. Not that I want to point any fingers or anything, but I'm pretty confident to say that. Yeah, but you know, I mean you, you would know much better than me, but I, I'd have to sit here and say any magazine that says they're doing great this day and age is probably lying. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean... Let, I'm let, not going to argue with you. No, you know, let, let's just be realistic here. Right. Print, but... print is a dying breed. I, and, and, and it's sort of like talking about CDs and vinyl. It's not that I like dying... I am a bit, or was a big magazine junkie. I mean, I re I would go to Tower Records magazine section, and I would walk out of there with six, eight magazines. I loved reading magazines, like I loved vinyl and record stores. The reality is, it's over. Right, it but sucks. I'm talking, talking it's over. about 2008. So 2008, it was wasn't fully over then, but no. but but any, was... any, but but I think you know, to Tim's credit here. He's looking at the numbers. He's looking at what's going on. You know, it was probably a hard decision to basically put a bullet in the baby's head, basically, as they say. Exactly. You know, it was I'm, exactly I'm, that. I'm killing my baby here. Right. And there's a lot of businesses that will, to this day, stand up and say, no, we are going to survive. We are going to survive. We don't the need record to do companies. Well, record companies, newspapers, magazines, you name it. They think they're going to buck the trend. And I applaud their their commitment and passion. Tenacity. But the reality is, guys, it's over. It, you're, it, it's, it's over. Books are over. Magazines are over. Physical media is over. It's been transformed. 
And the longer you put off that transition, I think that means it's going to be more painful of a transition to make. Yeah, I mean, even uh, recently in where I live, they were talking about should we still teach cursive writing to kids in school because nobody does it anymore. Oh, so yeah. that, that's big down here too. It's like you know, yeah, yeah. it it you know people. Here, listen. I I never d took to cursive writing. I just could never get it. I was always print. But I even find myself to this day, if I have to take handwritten printed notes, it's hard. It's definitely a struggle. It's, it's hard to even hand write simple Ooh. characters anymore because I'm so used to just typing away, typing away. Yeah, that, I that I I find my handwriting has become so sloppy I can't even read it anymore. <laughs> Now, now, let me put this to Tim. You so, so in 2008, you say it doesn't make sense. The magazine's got to go. I don't want to lose my house. Yeah, but since Seriously. then, yeah. since then, more and more people have gone to Kindles and iPads. Is it time to revive or make a version that's sort of a, 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 a Brave Words app? I mean, people love their mini iPads and their iPads, and... Other than going to Safari and typing you up, there's no presence. So now is it time to think digitally, think magazine in, in app form? Classic Rock does it. Others do it. But that uh, content is, you know what I mean? It's, it, it can't change. I think we're doing a better service than we, we could have done with any magazine right now updating the news, updating True. the features with audio, video, you name it. It's, 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 at the, it's at my little mouse right here. You know what I mean? It's, it's that easy to change. So whether it's on paper or whether it's on an iPad, I just think we're doing a better service. So it still amazes me when people say, can I get a subscription? It's like, why? Right. <laughs> why? I mean, you know, and Mitch, to, to your point, I, I, I would say that any, any of these devices that has a web browser built in, and they all do, has the Brave Words magazine available on it because they just go to bravewords.com and there it is. You don't need an app to recreate no, exactly I what's fully in the agree. website. And, and, and to that point, I subscribed for a while to Classic Rock Magazine's app. Right. And I, I love their magazine. I love their news. Right. It was a fucking atrocious pain in the ass. Okay. Downloading what? this app and then, and, and sort of to Tim's point, you get static content. It's 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 a recreation of the magazine. I want right now. I'm going to the website to get that. I don't right. need an app to recreate what's already out there. I think the app, and this is I've always preached this to bands. Your app shouldn't just be your website. Right. Your app should be something completely different that complements oh, complements <laughs> what you're doing. Oh, now, now I, I just I just noticed Classic Rock Magazine has got a I think it's a fairly new app that is like this day in classic rock history, which is kind of a cool concept. They're yeah. selling it for two dollars and ninety nine cents. No, thank you. I'm like, no, thank you. I mean, somebody wrote the review on it going, this this is a cool app. I love it, but it's worth ninety nine cents at best. I'm not paying yeah. three dollars. But the concept of that app is it's good. cool. Well, in fact, that's something a concept that Tim used to do years ago on Bravers. Every, I think, once a week, or there would be a whole. Here's the birthday. Here's the this. Here's the that. Now that feature has, you know, moved on, but it was there for a while. It's, Might be it's, I, I'm updating it. I'm updating that every day in Facebook right now. Okay. And more to your point about the 299 app. Yeah, there's this day in music.com. That's not just a heavy metal thing. It's, it's everything. in everything. And it's free, and it changes. It's in England, so in a couple of hours, it'll have tomorrow's news. So you even get it ahead of time right. if you're in North America. <laughs> right. Yeah. So yeah, who needs a, an app? I, I don't know. It's, it's, I don't know. I just, I, it just seems to me marketing-wise that a lot of sort of middle America like the concept of apps. It, it's, I don't know. It just seems to be that way. They, they, they it, like it, their it, little it, iPad it, and it, flipping it, pages. It, it is a... Apps themselves are a very cool, hot happening thing. Right. I think what you're going to see is kind of a bubble bursting of apps. Meaning, I agreed because everybody there's way think, too many. There's way too many of them doing nothing special. You know, for a number of years now, publications have been trying to create apps to bring their publication to the iPad, and it's just not. It's just not grabbing. You know, no, and, and believe me, and I've tried it. I mean. I've I've tried subscribing to Wired, 
I've subscribed to uh, Zinio, which gives you digital versions of Macworld and stuff like that, and Classic. It, right. It's just not grabbing because when I want that news, what am I doing? I'm just jumping onto the website or I'm getting an email update or I'm checking an RSS feed. And it's funny, though, you know, because I, I did try the Classic Rock app for a while and I was like, well, I have the print version right here and I'm just reading the same thing on the app. And yet I prefer reading a digital book over the real book. I preferred reading Peter Chris's book on my iPhone than I did having the book. So, But see, the, there, there, there's, there's the differences. A book is only hard copy or a digital version. There's not right. a website of a book. Correct. You know, a magazine quite often, as, as Tim is doing with Brave Words, you have a and website class. of your magazine where you put all the news and the stories and additional content that didn't make the print version. Right. So what is the reason to have that kind of middle ground app that is sort of just a duplicate of a print version, which you don't need? Now, I, I would take a digital magazine over a print magazine because I'd much rather have everything in this little device with me all the time. But I got the access to the Internet. I'll go to BraveWords.com and get everything I need. I don't need to wait for Tim to release next month's app. Or next I, month's download content or whatever. Yeah. You're right. Now, I distinctly remember going through like all the news that, we'd be, we, that we would be posting on BraveWords.com to build the magazine for that next month. You know what I mean? It would be like just bucket loads of content. So there, like, there's the answer right there. Here's bucket loads of content that I'm editing for like two, three weeks to put this into print form. Right. Let's just get rid of the print form and just keep on delivering all this bucket loads of content that we want. And because as soon as you as soon as you take the 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 file of the print magazine to go get printed, it's already outdated and old. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. So the writing was on the wall, and um, it was a beautiful history. Uh, I don't know. I'm glad I did it. I, I've got like still truckloads in my garage. The so anyone that wants to get any back issues, please contact me at ultimatebravers.com. <laughs> no, but no, it was it was a great run. It was awesome. It really was. So so, so, so well, I was going to say, where do you move into the future? I mean, do you, uh, have, is it time to redesign the site? Is it time to add extra features? How how do you keep it fresh and keep people wanting to come back? You know, other than just the news. Well, the, the current state of the site is pushing seven, eight years old. So right. we're pre pre Twitter, pre Facebook, pre all this everything. There were, we're pre a lot of things. So yeah, there's there's uh, movements afoot to kind of redesign and and get, and get things refreshed um, in, in the short term. That's all I will say. Okay. You're not coming out with the holographic version of Metal Tim <laughs> reading you the news every day. <laughs> That'll be good. Jeez. No, 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 no. That's that's not on the priority list. So. How, how about like one nine hundred Metal Tim? Yeah. <laughs> no, what you I need thought is, that number was taken. You need an embedded video of Tim every day just reading the news to you on YouTube. That's what you need. I'm exhausted <laughs> enough. My day is just yeah. It's it's packed full. And it's, um, as I've explained to Michael recently, it's, it's it, the scene, it's, it's just on fire. It's, there's just so much going on that um, I can barely keep my eyes open throughout the day. There's just, it's, it's an incredible time. You know what I mean? You can just see, it's, it's not just magazines that have gone like, like that way. It's, it's kind of fueled this fire, the internet, everything. It's, it's, it's better for fans. It's better for the industry. Everyone... You can point at Lars Ulrich and, and the whole Napster thing that um, it was like the death knell to everything. No, I think it's 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 taken a few years to get this business model back um, and, and figure it out. And I, I know a lot of bands are still trying to figure it out. But this is the most beautiful time in heavy metal music, especially if you're a fan of live bands because they're forced out on the road all the time. So it's it's we are just swamped here, and it's a good thing. You look at the releases coming out with with the Judas Priest, Black Sabbath, Alice in Chains, Volbeat, Megadeth. Like it's it's unheard of. Yeah, I mean it, it. It is funny that you know people will say, "Oh, the internet killed the music industry." You know, there's no sales anymore. Bands can't get record deals anymore. And and the reality is, I think to your point, it's much better now. It's much stronger. There's more music coming out now than there was 
when you might say what was the heyday of the metal era of the 80s and then into the 90s, I think there's more coming out now. Why? Because bands can now do it all themselves. They don't need a record label to get music released. They don't need a print version of Brave Words to, to, to anoint them with the one review that they can give once a month. Right. They're, they don't need the record company guy talking about our quarterly re releases. No, you can't release this in the second quarter. We'll have to put you off to the fourth. And you, you, can, you can release <laughs> anything you want, whenever you want, and you've got full control over it. I mean, I mean you, guys, you guys are no Russ Dwarf. I'm working with Russ Dwarf. He's re he released that wireless CD, and instantly it was like the number one selling CD on Bandcamp.com, which is one of the largest indie sell-your-own-music sites out there. Right. I mean, if, if he didn't have that opportunity, it was the old-school world, he'd be running around begging a record company to give him a crappy, crappy deal. <laughs> which he wouldn't get. Which he, he yeah, get. he wouldn't. He wouldn't get because they'd sit here and go, "Well, your your history, your old, your old news. Too Nobody old, cares right. about you." The twenty year olds won't want you. Yeah, and it's so, not true. People I mean, bought it. So now bands can release music, and they don't have to worry about, "Do I need to sell a hundred thousand units?" It doesn't really matter. You know, you can record this stuff in your home studios. You don't even have. I mean, Mitch, you know this doing your your mm -hmm. tribute CD thing. You don't even need to go physical goods if you don't want to. No, and I mean, the, the only part of why we're actually doing a physical CD is because we went through Pledge Music, and that's sort of what they sell. They don't, you don't do a Pledge Music campaign to get a digital download file. You do it to get something physical. But many of the artists you know, who are involved, you know, the Troys and the, the, the Bumblefoots and all that, they said, why are you doing a CD? We'll just send you the songs, and when you have enough, contact <laughs> iTunes. Exactly. I mean, it's, I it's, said, it's, yeah, it's, but, but part of it is getting the word out and, and you know, raising awareness for the home, and it's more than just putting it out on iTunes. So, but yeah, I mean, Don Doc, and the first thing he said to me is, he goes, why are you doing a CD and charging 20 bucks? Throw it on the internet for 99 cents. And I'm like... I, I always tell bands, you only need CDs to sell at your shows. That's it, you know. So, right. so do a run of a couple hundred, because God knows you don't want to end up with a garage filled with five thousand CDs because you couldn't get them distributed and sold. But you know that that is the one thing that's adva advantageous of a, like Pledge Music is you you know you raise the money you want, and then with that you go. I'm going to only buy five hundred CDs because that's what was ordered. So. It does help you with the numbers where you don't make a run of 2,500 and then cross your fingers. Yeah, it's, it, it, you know, the crowdfunding is kind of cool because, you know, in a sense, because of the internet, bands are screaming that people are stealing music. Nobody buys my music anymore. And with the crowdfunding, you're actually getting people to buy your music up front. Yeah. I mean, in my case, they, they paid for it six months ahead of time. And it's, it's funded. Yeah. And your case is your in. case is definitely different um, in a special category because I'm not a big fan of this whole crowdfunding thing. I, I just don't agree with paying for art before you see it. Whether you're a painter, a filmmaker, or you're an artist um, drumming and pounding on a drum, you know what I mean? Like that, that kiss, like the cancer thing. Like that's that's a pretty that's a pretty serious thing. And we right. were happy to help out, and, and I wish you the best of luck at, with yeah. it. But Thank you. when I, I'm seeing a ton of bands doing this, and I'm even seeing it snowball into bands that are like, my, our van broke down, can you send me some PayPal to take to the garage? I'm like, this is ridiculous. This is really right. getting out of hand. I, my I, two cents. I, 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 I would agree. I mean, here, the crowdfunding has to be done right. <clears throat> it has to be done for real value. I mean, you know, and to me, there's no real value in the "oh, help us repair our van" type of thing. What am I getting no. out of? What am I getting out of that as a fan? Right. I'm also hesitant, you know, and I've done a lot of Kickstarter, bought into a lot of Kickstarter and Pledge Music campaigns. It's rougher to tougher for me to do that if I don't know the artist. Right. So if I don't know their art, if I don't know what they're going, what they've done in the past, it's it's very much. You want me to buy in completely unknown on the promise you're going to do something, as opposed to, you know, I'm buying into Tony Arnell and, and, Bumblefoot. and Bumblefoot. I'm like, I okay, did too. I, 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 I understand where you guys are coming from. 
I understand right. your music. So and I'm very it, happy with what they delivered so far. So so that that's an easier sell for me, and and that's why I think it's it's and a, Ginger Wild Hearts. Yes, Ginger is the same thing. It's a very young developing business model right now, and I think the downside right now is a lot of people see it as an easy cash grab. Right. All we got to do is sign up to Kickstarter, put our name out there, and fans are just going to show up at the door and give us ten thousand dollars they it doesn't work that way and if that's how you <laughs> think it works you're gonna fail and 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 i think mitch you've seen this through your experience you've got to come up with very cool pledges awards rewards that these people get because more than anything that's what they're buying not yeah. the cd itself they're buying the fact that they get a Skype lesson from Don Dockin or whatever, you know, whatever Ron Keel gave you or something like that. Right. That's what they're, the music almost becomes secondary. And, and, and in my mind, what that is, it's just another form of the VIP packages that many bands are doing. It's like, yeah, it's great I'm buying a ticket to the show, but that ain't what I'm buying. I'm really buying that opportunity to go back and spend some time with you and get a picture with you and get some exclusive this and exclusive that. And, and that's what pushed me over, those things. Those, those things, that exactly. That's what pushes you over. And I, I, I give this example to a lot of people. I don't know if you guys remember a band out of, I don't know, the 70s, 80s, Axe, Rock and Roll Party in the Street. Yes. So I love, I, love, yeah. I love that song. It's one of my all-time favorite songs. <laughs> And they played uh, the Sweden Rock Festival, I think it was last year. And they filmed the show, professionally filmed it, and they wanted to release a DVD of this. Well, that's fine. That's cool. They ran a Kickstarter program, and they were looking for $100,000 to do a DVD. Excuse me? $100,000 <laughs> to do a DVD release. Now... Again, keep in mind, this isn't to get money to begin filming. They'd already filmed it. This, they now just need to edit press it. and press it and get it released. And their awards sucked. It's like, oh, yeah, you know, we'll get you this one early, and then you can get an autographed DVD, and then you can get a T-shirt and a DVD. And that was sort of it. And then on top of it, I looked at their online world, and they had like 80 fans on Facebook. <laughs> I'm, I'm like guys this is this is the embarrassment that is crowdfunding stuff like what you're doing first of all we all know you don't need a hundred thousand dollars to edit and press up a dvd no they're just trying to get a salary you see exactly you're trying to line your pockets and we know you don't need to do that two you're not giving me crap as a reward I might as well just wait for you to do this and buy the DVD when it comes out because I'm not getting anything special to pledge. And third, you got no fans to even pledge. <laughs> no, and that's what yeah. leaves a bad taste in my mouth. But I got to ask you because you brought it up because you wouldn't support this type of thing unless you knew the artist. And if you know the artist and they have a history, that means they have a brand. So isn't right. that brand worth some money? So why do you need to go to your fan base when, you know what I mean, you yourself as a brand, as an entity, like are, are worth something as is. And but if you're a band and there's four or five of you and you can't fund this album in your home doing garage band or whatever, like it's, it's, I, I look at but, the protest, but, the hero thing yeah, but, and like the amount of money that they make, like it's, it's insane the amount of money that's being thrown at some of these bands and you really need that much. But I think here, here's a, here's a, a key point is, Bands shouldn't just look at this as a simple, give me money to record music. They need to create something above and beyond just recording music, and they need to create an experience that the fans can come into and take part in that creative process. So mm -hmm. to, to me, you know, if, hey, if KISS came, to, came up and said, we're going to do a crowdfunding campaign, and we're going to use this not to just record a new album, that's part of it, but we're going to create something exponentially on top of it that's never been done before. And as part of this process, as pledging, 
you get to be part of that creative process. Right. You get to hear snippets of the song and choose which ones we should complete or which ones should make the final that, album. That, to, to me, that is what needs to be done, and that's what makes this worthwhile. And that's what I will pledge into. I'm right. not going to pledge into somebody who just says, I need $5,000 so I can record this CD and release it next month and give you no updates beyond this. It's sort of like... I, I, there's no relationship there. There's nothing right. unique that you're bringing me into. As a fan, I want to, I want to be part of your creative process. And I, and I think Tim was mentioning that if you have a brand, then somebody should recognize it and put the album out for you. In a sense, like Universal should sign you up and say. But you know, part of the pledge music, like for with Ginger, was the fact that he had a brand that could attract it. And then he wants to say, I want complete creative control. So when you have a brand, that gives you the permission to have the creative control. And I think that's what's exciting for somebody like Ginger or Tony Harnell or Bumblefoot. Because, yeah, they could get signed to Universal or Cleopatra or Deadline or whatever record. But then you've got some guy behind you going, that needs a little more guitar. Nah, that needs a little more. Oh, that, that lyric. And so that's why you need the brand. Now, the other bands that have no brands, well, they got to establish it online. They got to put some stuff out on YouTube. They got to get on that Twitter and on that Facebook and create a buzz that eventually can lead to a pledge campaign. But I, yeah. I can see it really as a creative control thing. I, I see that as a big issue. And, and, you know, throwing something out, and I don't know whether you'd say this is a devil's advocate side of it, but... Sure, an artist could potentially sit here and say, I'm going to take my own money, I'm going to go in and record, I'm then going to release this, and I'm going to ask my fans to buy it. Well, we know fans don't buy music. Right. They steal your music. So at the end of the day, the artist is completely out that money, and to a point where it may detrimentally impact them from being able to tour, or being able to record more music, or something like that, because they couldn't recoup it. In this simple case, all they're saying is, I'm going to record music, but I want you to pay for this music up front so I know that I'm at least going to be able to recover my costs and continue right. progressing as an artist. You know, if people bought music, I don't think... I think it's a fair statement to say, if people bought music, crowdfunding wouldn't, wouldn't exist. True. <clears throat> crowdfunding would not have been, you know... A thing in 1987 because people were buying CDs by the truckload. Right. You know. Now let's get back to Tim here quickly in the metal world. Uh, you're you're talking about how it's this revival. Yet everybody sort of, if you look at mainstream media, metal music is underground music. You look at the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. They're not putting in Slayer. They're not putting in Iron Maiden. They're putting in Chuck D. So tell me a little bit why you think metal's coming back. Oh, please. Do we need to talk about the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame? Well, yeah, I agree. Is it, is it, they don't deserve it, to, the attention. No, oh, I, I agree. My, but my but mainstream media, that's what they base it on. You look at NBC News' website or CNN, all they run is the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame has said this. That's, that's the rock news for them. I mean, yeah, but if you're a real fan, you're not paying attention to that stuff. <laughs> right. So, but so, so tell me a little bit, like how, how much of it is bubbling? I mean, what are the numbers? People think of metal as this stuff you see in a club that's down the road where all the hookers hang out. And is it, you know what? I, I, I think the extreme bands, the ones that are underground, like it, it needs to be a familiar name to be able to get over that threshold, whether you're a, like, and there's a, there's still a ton of bands that for the three of us, they're like, like a, like a, a like a home name. But, um, for the rest of society, it's, you, you look at the circle of friends that you might hang out with and it's like, it just goes way over their heads. So it's, I don't think that's ever going to be the, the case where, Bands that um, are like a level below a Judas Priest or a Slayer or Metallica, like it's. But that's it. Is metal dominated by sort of dinosaur bands, bands that have been around for thirty years, or is there a uh, resurgence of new bands coming out? Is there a, a new? I mean, we went from you know uh, uh, whatever glam and thrash and 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 new metal. Is there a a new wave of something coming out? 
you look at Mastodon, you look at the new okay. Ghost record, there, there, okay. there's still like a ton of bands that are coming out all the time, but they're, they're, they will never get to the point of a Metallica. We're never going to see a big four, you know what I mean? There's not going to be like a, a Trivium and Dragon Force and blood, whatever other power metal band at, at the time that's going to be the big four in 20 years. No, I think it's a really valid question, but it's also consider like, Look! Look at your record collecting from the '80s and the right. selection and the amount of bands and the stuff that was coming out. You could afford it. These days, you've got like every week. There's like a dozen, who knows how many things that that, that you can actually. So it's just it's 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 easy to get lost these days. Back in the in the late '70s and the '80s, it was much easier to be a fan. You could keep track of everything. Yeah. It was it was. You know you what I mean? Four or five you you had bands. room in your collection for it. Now I don't have room for anything. <laughs> I, yeah, you can see that in the back. <laughs> well, that's nothing. <laughs> <laughs> I imagine. No, but you've got a valid question. But I think there's there's still a lot of bands um, that are bubbling under that I, I don't think you're going to see on CNN unless there's a death. Right. God forbid. You know what I mean? It's it's just the way it is. And if you're a fan, you're not paying attention to any of these things. You know what I mean? It was a laugh when whatever Mustaine did on stage and overseas, like yapping his mouth off. And it was part of um, Anderson Cooper's um, shtick at the end of his show. You know what I mean? Like that's once in a blue moon. If, if you're a metal fan, you're not paying attention to anything aside from your computer screen. So, so what bands should we be looking for? Who, who are sort of the rising stars that you see? If, if I go to your record collection, what's the new band that I might find in your CD player or in your iPod? Right now, I think this band Ghost is, um, yeah. is is taking off. Like it's it's a big universal priority. But when you see Rod Smallwood um, bringing them on board for the Iron Maiden dates in South America, like it's and I think they just played Coachella, for example. And it's, and this is like a retro band. This is not a black metal band. They they look totally like black metal, but it, it just sounds like like classic prog metal. So I've always been a, a a big believer that that's like that was that that is one sector of 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 music that really has like has a future. You look at Opeth, you look at Enslaved. Some of these bands, it's like they're dropping the growling vocals, and it's just it's it's totally for, for like it's 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 head it's headphone music, right? No, it's a beautiful thing. And of course, how about, uh, you? How about you? What's what's sticking out in your world? New wise, boy, not not really a lot. I'm I'm a classic kind of guy, though. You know, listen. Uh, I have a connection to Alan Niven. He sent me this Stormer Perception CD, this new band. I think it's quite good. I think he did a great job on it. But, uh, you know, and I'm, I'm looking forward to the new Sabbath, I have to tell you. I'm looking forward to the uh, upcoming uh, uh, catalog releases of Dio that's coming out, you know, live in Philly and all this stuff. I'm looking forward to the Judas Priest DVD. I got the White Snake live. I hate to tell you, but my music... Um, pedigree stopped in 1987 and you know i'm quite proud of that so michael <laughs> well well we uh, heard, sorry. yeah i'm trying to think you know new bands i'm always willing to give new bands a shot um the problem is that you give them a shot you dig them for a week you think this is the greatest new record and then 20 days later you're you're back to listening to priest and you go yeah, this is comfortable. I like this old shoe. I'm, I'm, I'm just I'm lo I'm looking through my every every Tuesday. I have fun on rdo.com. I create a new release Tuesday playlist, trying to trying to bring back that excitement of Tuesdays when they used to be really exciting. Right, and then on Wednesday you go back to listening to Kiss, and that that's the problem. Well, or that's what I, we well, do. I don't no, I don't go back to listening to Kiss. That's for sure. Ugh. <laughs> and by uh, the way, that's when we sold the most magazines was on a Tuesday because it was the biggest release date, that, right? That's when, right. when you'd come in because you knew stuff came out. And, you know, hey, labels still do that. They still release stuff on Tuesdays. Yeah. So I'm just trying to look Which is through. very peculiar because, uh, we and we've talked about this many times, in Australia the release date's Friday. So the new Van Halen shows up on a Friday in Australia. You have to wait four days for North America. But by then, everybody's <laughs> uploaded it to a torrent site. So you're like... What are they thinking? The, the, you know, well, yeah, the new yeah, deep. They're not thinking. The new deep purple was released uh, Tuesday, this past Tuesday, over in Europe. Right. It's yeah. not. It's not streeting here in the U.S. until next week. Well, it, no, it's streeting all over everybody's internet right now. <laughs> uh, I haven't seen it. I haven't seen it hit the 
the, the download sites yet. Of course, I don't look too much anymore. Um, but if you rely on the BraveWords.com clock, it's not out for four days. <laughs> right. Well, exactly. you, <laughs> you, if you rely on the record label telling you when you're allowed to buy it because of what country you live in. Yes, right. and, and, and that concept is outdated, and I, I just don't understand why they hold to it. They should say, you know, January 2nd, everybody gets Van Halen. January 4th, everybody gets Kiss. This Friday, Japan, and Monday, to it, it doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense. You know, sense. I, I've got to say for this year, there isn't anything brand new, new artist, first release, that is really hit me as something I really like yet. Um, you know, I tried to give Cobra and the Lotus two shots. Didn't do anything for me. Didn't do anything. Um, and the only reason I gave him a shot was because... Gene Simmons. Gene Simmons. But pass. Other than that, you know, this year, I'm... You know, I like the new Pretty Maids, which they're not a new band. The nope. new The new Saxon. They're not a new band. Nope. Uh, you good. know, Russ Dwarf's wireless. He's not a new, new artist. That was good too. Um, so, you know, there's nothing that, and, and quite honestly, the, um, oh God, what else is the kiss tribute? I don't know. I'm not allowed to listen to that yet. <laughs> nobody's it's letting good. Me, nobody's letting me listen to that. Um, it's good. you'll love it. There's only one album that's in my potential 2013 albums of the year, and that's Steve Lukather. And he's not new. And he's not new either. He's, not new. <laughs> he's far it's from a, new. It, it, yeah. he's, he's far from new. It's a new album, but he's far from new. I mean, there isn't a brand new artist. Like, you know, I wouldn't say they were brand new, but last year, Hailstorm was in my top ten. Yeah. Last year, you could say, was their breakout year. But see, that's a perfect example of what I'm talking about. I saw them do the Skid Row cover. I saw them do a couple of other covers. I checked them out on YouTube. I thought it was great. I thought it was full of energy. I listened to it. I think the album's great. She's a great singer. And I, and, and I just can't be motivated to put it on anymore. And it's not because the band did anything wrong. It's just, I don't know. I'm, I, I'm not 18. It's not my music. I... You know, I think Rob Zombie said it best. He was on Howard Stern last week, and he said, I just can't relate to music being written by somebody younger than me. And I said, you know what? I I'm with you, Rob. That that's pretty much it. Neither can I. You know, that's not a problem for me. I think what the problem is more, and maybe it's just because I'm, I'm, I'm older and more mature and smarter, it's... Whoa, whoa, See, no. it's, it's not see, so fast there. <laughs> it, it's seeing a 16-year-old kid sing about heartbreak and, you know, boyfriends and girlfriends leaving them and, you know, the, you know, the heartaches of the world. And I'm just sort of like, dude. Oh, you stupid you're, dumbass. You're, you're freaking not that big of a you're deal. You're 15 years old. You haven't even begun to deal with the realities of the world shitting on right. you. <laughs> Start writing about paying your taxes. Now, now let's talk. Um, you, you, you know, you, but, yeah, I mean, until you've actually had a divorce and you've got kids in that scenario, you know, you don't, you can't talk about that misery. Right. So the the fact that it's a 15 year old kid performing doesn't bother me. It's them writing about stuff that we all know was actually not even written by them. It was written by somebody else, given to them to sing. And you're like, really? Why are you singing that? It, it's, it, that that's the problem. That's the problem. Another problem is I've got the bands that created the misery, two new releases, for example, the new Megadeth and new Black Sabbath, but they don't sound so miserable these days. And it's true. I just I listened to the, the new Megadeth song. They finally released the, the full title track to Super Collider, and it's a rock song. And the Sabbath song is this eight minutes of droning cathedral. I don't want to hear cathedral. I want to hear sabotage. I want to hear anger. I want to hear, you know what I mean? I just want it to be vicious. Yeah. And it's far from vicious. Mustaine is more vicious talking about the bullshit politics of his ass. Yep. Uh, th then musically, the dude, like, <laughs> M M Mitch and I, you're mega death. Mitch and I have said this many times. These bands can't write that type of stuff. They can't sing that type of stuff anymore because they're fucking living in their mansions in Beverly Hills, flying on a private jet, 
staying at the Four Seasons. Their life does not suck right now. So you can't write about how rough it is being a young band out on the road, traveling in the back of a, of a, of a pickup truck, pulling your own gear, looking for a group. You know, you can't say that anymore. I'm sorry, you know, even, even Kiss Monster, I have a hard time listening to Paul with some of those lyrics. It's like... Oh, look, take me down below, for dude, example. Dude, come on. You're, you're fucking married with how many kids? You can't be singing about nailing groupies. No, it should be take me out to Applebee's. Take me <laughs> out to Applebee's. That's what it should be. No, I think Mustaine needs to have his big fo big four ID card revoked unless we hear something a little bit more vibrant on this new album. But that's but, just but, but, but so, 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 Tim, so let me ask you, could he even do that then? I mean, do you think it's even possible to do that? Because as I said, these guys are in such a different place that how can... How can any of those bands, how can anybody in Black Sabbath write about being fucking miserable? Lars and, Het Lars and Hetfield, they no, no. are in, in a bigger play. A t like, they're a little bit elevated, high, a lot higher than Mustaine. And they definitely could do it. The guys from Slayer can do it. How do the they guys do from it? Anthrax, for how the most they, part, can do it. How do they do it. it then? How do they do it? You know, I guess they're just it's, able to put themselves back in that yeah. place. Exactly. They're just and sitting maybe, in a room maybe it's time looking at each other. Face. We still have the fire. We're still, we still got it, man. We still need to have it. Maybe but it's the look, kids keeping in and going, you know what I mean? Maybe, they, maybe they're listening to their fan base. And maybe some other bands, like I'm not going to mention any names, are just so insulated. They don't, they don't give a shit what's going on outside their world. They just, they just, oh my God, this is the greatest riff of all time. Meanwhile, they haven't even heard anything on the radio that's, you know what I mean, that's, that's metal related. Yeah, but, but, you know, but, but Anthrax still has a little bit of the hunger because Anthrax hasn't had that easy of a road. No, I you're mean, right about that. They're still yeah. getting sort of shitty opening slots. They're still sort of playing shitty clubs once in a while. So there still is that passion. And the fact that they haven't given up is sort of, you know, a testament to them. And they're still kind of in that place but, but I'll, in a I'll, lot of frustration you know but i'll even say to like to to the metallica point i mean isn't part of the problem just how can you picture them singing something like that when you just heard about james going to a pta meeting with his little child no i know I, but i think that that I mean, comes that, from that, lars that, that i think that, lars is cerebrally you know he he studied metal to, to him i think it's a science and he's able to say this and this and this makes a metal song. He, I, I think he's just a walking encyclopedia I'm, I'm that not, knows what parts to put together. I'm not saying that they don't know how to put the parts together. What I'm saying is, as us listening to it and knowing so much about all these artists these days, when you listen to that song and go, well, yeah, it's got some kick-ass lyrics and it sounds great, but, oh, hey, look who's on the cover of People magazine walking out of Applebee's. It's Lars with his family. That right there, that disconnect, sort right. of destroys it, because yeah, all of a sudden he's 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 dad going to Applebee's with the family, and how can you hear that song the same way with that visual in your head? And that's yeah. why I didn't watch some kind of monster. I don't want to watch it. I and that's why I didn't it. ever watch Family Jewels. I, I so stupid. Oh please, Mitch. Family Jewels isn't going to change the way a Kiss song sounds. <laughs> Jesus. No, but I mean, that, that was just a stupid show. <laughs> even, even the Osbournes, you know, I watched the first season because everybody had to watch it. But after that, come on. Now, uh, let's get back to Tim it's a second. Not, it's, not, it's not like Gene Simmons is going to be more demonic because you didn't see him on the fucking Family Jewels. I mean, come on. It's, it, let's be serious. Kiss doesn't take themselves that seriously. Yes, he is more <laughs> demonic. <God>. Uh, uh, <laughs> but let, let's get back to Sabbath, because that's the, sort of the next big record. And, and I know Tim's been a fan since, well, I don't want to say day one, because, you know, Tim's not 186 years old. But you've been there almost since the beginning. You've been through the lineup changes. You've been through Ozzy solo. You've been through Dio and the bands, you know. What's your expectation? You you just indicated that you think the first song is mm, not that great. Well, we've heard two because there was the other one that they performed right, live, live in New Zealand, right? In Australia. So, and they're both kind of the same droning thing. So I, I don't want to say too much right now, honestly, because there's there's another what what, seven, eight tracks. I, I expect that Rick Rubin has some kind of vision on this thing. He's certainly talking about it in those videos. 
Who knows? Who knows? The Sabbath songs have to be long. I mean, I would personally love 10 tracks of Three Minute Paranoids than these droning on eight minute, you know. Mm. Give me a couple of epics. Definitely give me a couple of epics, but I don't Pop, think they all need a whole to album. No, no, no. Mitch, Maybe if you're Rush, I want a whole album of that. But Mitch, you know, as, as we talked about on last week's episode when we listened to God is Dead, it wasn't so much that the song was bad because we loved the music. Musically, we just, it was fine. We just felt like it just didn't get anywhere. It felt like, all right, it, uh, there's the solo. Oh, wait, it just ended after 10 seconds. You know, oh. Uh, there was a lot of build up and no payoff. Exactly. There was a lot of Ozzy feeling like he was singing the intro to a song that never got started. Yeah, and, and there's definitely something going on with Ozzy's voice. It, you know, it just. It, Listen, it's like a baseball player. You can't pitch when, you get in, when you're when you 50, but it doesn't sound like that Sabbath vocal. It sounds like an Ozzy Osbourne solo album vocal, and they're not the same to me. And I don't know if people understand what I mean, but it sounds cleaner, more radio-friendly. It's not that morose Sabbath Ozzy voice. Yeah, I, I agree. I was... I, you hit the nail on the head right there. It's it's definitely leaning more towards an Aussie solo record than a Black Sabbath album. But there's so much time has gone by, and he really wasn't even part. His head wasn't even in, in Never Say Die at the time, right? It's right. it's we're talking a lot of time. A lot of water's going underneath, underneath the bridge before yeah, how long has it been? 30, Black Sabbath has actually created a record. Thirty five years, right? 30, 34, 35? 78 was Never Say Die. Yep. Yeah, yep. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah, it's like 35 years. So, you know, it's understandable yet. So it's, Van, Van Halen managed to do it. So, But they apparently were using old ideas. And I guess these are all new ideas that Sabbath are using. So, and it's yeah, hopeful that the rest of the album is strong. I, I'm, 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 I'm totally with Tim on that. It's like, you know, I really want, I'm still super excited to hear the rest of the album. Me too. Um, you know, again, I love, I love the music on it. And, and I will actually say, so after we previewed it last week, it was released on iTunes the next day, and I downloaded it on iTunes. Like I said, I would give it that shot. I would play it more. I could play it louder. I could experience. It's growing a little more on me, you know, being able to listen to it in your environment, how you want to listen to it. I mean, we all know music is, that's a big part of music, is not being forced to listen oh, to it at a This is a big part spot. of the music, too. I love radio.com. I heart radio. Oh, sh I heart radio .com. <laughs> Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> That's a big part of it too. <laughs> exactly. You know? But you know, no, you want, you want to be able to put it on your iPod and put the headphones in and listen, listen to it where, where as you... a metal fan, I want it to succeed because if it succeeds, that means more metal bands will get a shot to put out another album. More people will say, Hey, Priest hasn't done something in a while. Let's give them a call. Hey, Maiden hasn't done. So I, I don't want this, this album to, to be a failure or to be put down. Yeah. I want it to succeed because eventually that means more Sabbath, more Kiss, more Maiden, more Priest. It keeps the scene alive. It's didn't, good for didn't, us. Didn't, good for me. Uh, am I mistaken in saying that I just saw somebody post something today that Maiden just announced they were going to record a new album for release next year? Steve told me um, an interview last summer when we were able to talk to him about his solo record, the, the British Line thing, that, yeah, there is definitely another Maiden album in the pipeline. Absolutely. Yeah. Whether it comes out next year, yeah, we saw those news reports, but, yeah, he told us a long I time ago. Convoluted I, 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 think, I think somebody had posted that, that it was Bruce who was on an interview yesterday and said that, uh, you know, he said they're, they're going to work on a new album that will be released in 2014. Good. Uh, you know, we, we, need it. we need it to keep going. It's um, important. I want a new Cheap Trick album. Damn it. I want, I want, a, I want a good Cheap Trick album. The last one was not bad. It wasn't great. It wasn't terrible. Do I see any hands for Pretty Boy Floyd? Jeez. Oh, no? Jesus Christ. No bitch. hands for Pretty Boy Floyd? Does anybody Just does anybody care? The silence <laughs> says everything. <laughs> no, but listen, uh, 
You know, the only good thing about the uh, Sabbath album is that on the cover they can put Hall of Famers Black Sabbath 13. So that, that sticker is going to be a big selling point. What? No? <laughs> Uh, where at a record store? I don't even know where I could go find a record store to buy a record. Oh, when it comes from Amazon.com, right there at Amazon.com, it should be a little little digital sticker that says "Rock and Roll Hall of Famers Black Sabbath Present 13." Huh? That's marketing right there. Yeah, that's marketing. That's why Mitch is not doing marketing. <laughs> right. <laughs> All right, so uh, are we listening to any music, or shall we wrap uh, up? No, I think, an we hour? Should, I think we should wrap up. We've been over an hour here. Right. We'll, 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 we'll save uh, next week to see what's worth listening to. Yeah, so, so we got to get the plugs in. Go out to BraveWords.com, Facebook, and I guess people call it a forward slash BraveWords. Uh, the Twitter is BraveWords666, I believe. Yes. Are we missing anything? Are you doing LinkedIn? Are you doing any of those other YouTube? Oh, there's a YouTube channel. Uh, what is a YouTube channel? Brave Words? Just Brave Words? Everything at BraveWords.com will direct you to all. Smarter. Yes. Easier to listen to. Remember, it's, it's the fast food generation. One website. Yeah. And it'll, one, it'll, one it'll, it'll, it'll guide you everywhere. everywhere. BraveWords.com. Yep. And, of course... Head over to DroppingTheNeedle.com or Dropping the Needle on Facebook. Leave us your comments. Let us know. We, need, we should give a little bit of homework here. Yeah. What, what Brave Words related homework could we give well, people? Well, uh, I think quite simply, uh, for those of you who, who don't know this site or even those who do, head on over, take a look, and tell us what you like and tell us. What you'd like to see the site uh, be? You know, what 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 can they improve on? What needs to and, be? I and, mean, that's and, my suggestion. And, and, and let us know if if you used to buy the magazine, the print version. Yeah. Let's see and how if, many people know still have memories of the print version. And if you can tell me who is on issue number one hundred, I will send some copies out. Yeah. There you go. The so tell me who who made the cake on issue number one hundred. And you will get a free copy. It actually includes a little miniature copy of issue number one. So you get actually two magazines and a CD for nothing. So, so, so for, the, for the first person who can answer that, is that okay. what you're saying? Sure. Okay, first person who can tell us who was on the cover of issue 100 of Brave Words. And Bloody Knuckles. And Can't bloody forget that part. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> Thank you so much. Hey guys. Tim, thanks so much. This was this was no. great just chatting metal shit. Amazing. <laughs> Absolutely amazing. So thank you so much. All right, and take go care. Go buy the Sabbath. Go buy Sabbath when it comes out. Yes. Metal. All right. All right, take, take care, care everyone. Bye. Hello, this is Bumblefoot from Guns N' Roses, and I just released my own award-winning gourmet hot sauces. From the mild cherry bourbon bumblelicious to the over-the-top bumblefucked. So, if you want to get bumblefucked, visit bumblefoot.com for more information. You've been listening to Dropping the Needle. Dropping the Needle. With Michael Branvold and Mitch LaFon.